I am with Angie and David in Ashland, Kentucky, and we're going to find out how they overcame major obstacles to grow their own edible garden on a budget. We're going to take a tour, sit down and have a chat, and then we're going to have some of Angie's homemade cooking. Sound good? Sounds great. Absolutely. <laughs> when I planned my trip to Tennessee to see my mother and Virginia to see my brother, I put out online, whoever wanted to have me come and visit to please let me know. This was the gal that let me know. <laughs> So I came from Abingdon, Virginia to Ashland, Kentucky to meet Angie in person and see her garden. So Angie, how long have you been watching Late Bloomer? I've been watching Late Bloomer for a little over a year. Yes. And when I finished the episode of Late Bloomer, that first episode, I was hooked. And here she was growing beautiful vegetables and, and gorgeous fruit and citrus. And she had such a positive attitude and if something if something went wrong, then she took it out and re and restarted. And I think that's one of the hardest things is when you, when you do face something that disappoints you or knocks you down, to get back up and to keep going and to try something new is, is very inspiring and very courageous. The video that I watched, the first one, spoke to me because you had factual information. You were facing challenges of very little sunlight and very little space. Right. And although I have a lot of space and plenty of sun on most of my garden, I can relate to challenges that most people would see as insurmountable. It was very inspiring. I understand that you have a K garden. Yes. Tell me about your <laughs> K garden. <laughs> uh, we have a container garden that we have called the K garden because we were inspired by late bloomer to build it. The side yard on the east side of my house was the drive for the old house that burned down. When that house burned down and the property was sold, it was covered with a very fine layer of dirt and then sod. So if you go down two to three inches, you hit solid shale rock with gravel base. Nothing will grow. It holds water. It doesn't drain. <laughs> There's no way to fix the drainage. And what did you tell me was like the final straw of trying to grow over there? <laughs> the final straw was when I was cleaning over in the side yard and it was very wet. Uh, we have very wet spring. And I reached down and picked up a pot to move it and this piece of dirt flung up on my arm. And it wasn't dirt. It was a leech. A leech, like a leech, like in the African Queen, leech in the river. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so did you just pull it off or what did you do? Um, yeah, I pulled it off real quick. <laughs> <laughs> I had a freak accident in my office at work 12 years ago. I was unable to walk for nearly three years and was in a wheelchair. I had surgery strictly to relieve the pain and upon coming out of surgery and recovery i was able to wiggle my big toe for the first time in three years and that's when i said to myself i will walk again no matter what they say and now i have all this my grandfather was the first generation of my family out of the hills he bought this property in 1949 and farmed it to raise food for his family he came out of the Great Depression, so growing your own food was not only just a hobby, it was imperative, a way of life. I bought the property in 1990. My grandfather died, and my grandmother lived in another home that they had shared together, and this property was going to be put up for sale. So I purchased it. I see a wheelchair sitting in your backyard over there. Is that left over from when you couldn't walk? Actually, we have the wheelchairs out so that we can move them around to sit in as we work in the garden. Okay. With my spinal cord injury, I have a one inch by five inch massive scar tissue that is inoperable. So I am limited on how long I'm able to stand or sit at any long period of time. Right. The weather has changed drastically over time. When I started gardening here in 1990, by October, the frosts were coming. Everything was dying, everything was down. It was time to collect the fodder shocks for the decorations for Halloween. Now, 
we have frost much later. We do not have the hard freezes that we used to. In the past five years, it has changed even more so. We have very few major snow events, major freezes. We have a lot more fungal diseases, bacterial diseases, insects, insects bring diseases. Cucumber beetles carry diseases on their bodies and as they inject the plants to damage them and feed off of them, it's, it's gotten much worse. We're seeing the bugs come earlier and staying later and they're surviving through the winters now, whereas before they would freeze out. Now they've become very adapted to surviving our winters. And when we warm up starting in February in this area now, out come the bugs. I had a tick bite in February. The biggest pests that we face in the garden are six-legged and four-legged. Aphids and flea beetles are the absolute worst pests, primarily because aphids and flea beetles are not so choosy. They will eat anything and everything in the garden. So polyculture is not as effective against those pests. And we have the four-legged pests. We have a lot of deer, a lot of rabbits, groundhogs, moles, voles. Voles decimated our red Norland potatoes and our cobbler potatoes. They have also damaged our Walla Walla onions and decimated our candy onions. So we've had to be very creative in solutions to get around them and avoid them without harming our beneficial insects and birds and snakes in our garden. Right. Well, you showed me a picture of a big rat snake. Yeah. Yeah, what happened with that? We were checking the garden for the night and found an approximate six foot rat snake tangled up in our netting around our beans. He was obviously hunting, possibly for moles and voles, which is why we like him. So David, my husband, held the net while I held his head and used the scissors to cut along his body without damaging him because you don't want to cut the scales or the skin. Any, any injury can cause him to have a slow death and we don't want that. Right. So right. we carefully cut him away and he slithered off and hissed a little bit and kept right on going. <laughs> a year ago, my husband was in a car accident. His pelvis was shattered. He's unable to work. So we have had to find creative solutions to have the garden that we want to have. What are some of the strategies you've used to garden on a budget? We have bought seeds instead of going to nurseries and buying plants. We have sourced wood chips for free from a tree cutting service. We use pallet wood, which is free, that's being thrown away. We also salvage um, wood and other things that have been tossed away from renovations, bricks and such. We also find rocks from rock slides on the highway and we use those in the garden as well as borders and stepping stones. We have small chairs, stumps, and other things that we use throughout the garden to provide place to sit and rest as we're in the garden working. This beautiful tree is a northern catalpa tree. It's indigenous to this part of Kentucky. It doesn't fruit. It does flower with small white flowers, but it doesn't fruit. They didn't expect me to survive. They weren't sure if I was going to walk either. And here I am walking and playing in the dirt. And what did the doctors say? That's only a year ago. Yeah, it was they were quite happy with how I've healed up. What do you attribute your recovery to? The care of my wife and uh, homegrown food as much as possible. And it's really, uh, the nutrition in the food has really made a difference. We notice the difference between summertime and wintertime. What percentage of the food you eat in the summer comes out of the garden? In the summertime, probably 75 or 80 percent of our vegetables when things start cooking. And, uh, and we can do our own canning too, so it what works beer? out quite a bit. And this year we've got a freezer, so we'll end up freezing what we couldn't freeze last year. What kind of berries do you have? Blackberries and blueberries. Um, we also have uh, figs, apples, peaches, pears. Tell me about that peach tree. It was planted by her grandfather decades ago, probably 60, maybe 70 years ago. It's twice as tall as the house is. Last year we harvested over 700 pears, lost count after that, and uh, we made all kinds of stuff out of them. Pear nectar, pear butter, pear everything. <laughs> <laughs> Do you feel like showing me around? Sure, absolutely. It sounds good. We also have strawberries too. I forgot to mention that. We lost several fruit trees 
this past year. They were older, but they have not been able to adapt and survive in the extreme changes of climate that we've seen, especially over the past five to 10 years. And so we saved our money and purchased 11 fruit trees to start rebuilding our orchard. This is a moon glow pear. Nice. And you'll notice these guards around the trees there to protect the tender trees from rabbits and deer. Rabbits will hurt the tree, they'll chew the bark, and it'll kill the tree before it ever gets a chance to start. It keeps the deer from this, and they don't seem to like that sound. The soil in Kentucky can often be clay. They say clay loam, but you could throw this clay on a pot or on a wheel and make a pot. It's, <laughs> for example, Squeeze it again. Ooh. We have been slowly getting the wood chips from the pile that the Wood Tree Service left us and dispersed them across the entire garden. This is an Asian pear. Uh, we're very excited about this one. It's also self-pollinating, so we just had to buy one and we've made sure to protect it. It is drooping just a little bit, but that's because of the heat that we've had. Yeah, I've got zinnias and cauliflower, late cauliflower started in there. More basil. This is an ever-bearing dwarf mulberry. So far, the deer have left the tree alone. However, deer are notorious for loving the mulberry fruit. You got comfrey. Yes. Nice. This, this is toothache plant, also known as spilanthes. I know. Beautiful. This is the yellow version, this one and this one. And I also have what's called the bullseye version, and it's over here. So it'll be yellow with reddish and a bullseye. And you can chew the flowers and it will leave a toothache. It makes your mouth tingle and go numb. It's got some morning glory vine tangled in it. And this is papalo. And this is one of your favorites, cilantro. Mm -hmm. Coriander and everything. Yes, this is Russian sage. But you're, it smells just amazing. And it's edible. This is English thyme. And it's lemon thyme. This is garlic chives, also known as Chinese chives. This is Bacal skullcap. What's that? It is an herb that can be used in tea. It has a calming effect. You can use the leaves to make tea. I've started a basil raised herb garden here. So far I've got um, the giant and the mammoth Napoletanum. This is Feverfew. You can chew the leaves and it relieves headache and inflammation. This is Echinacea. Although it's very small, the deer ate it down to the ground and stunted its growth. Normally it would be about this tall about two to three feet. Mm. This whole thing is Rose of Sharon? Yeah, this whole hedge that I put in. The whole thing's gonna bloom or it already yeah. has? Or No, it's getting ready to, it blooms throughout the whole summer. Oh, Just wow. Butterflies, pollinators love it. Rose of Sharon, I have to get that. It's in the hibiscus family. Oh, okay. These are cosmic purple carrots. These are Relanca carrots. We have found that it is a great way to grow the carrots. It protects them. It provides them a great area to grow in. Um, it warms earlier in the season, so we're able to plant the seed earlier in the season. It keeps them at a constant temperature. Um, with the only problem that we had was deer eating the cosmic purple carrots one morning. One of my favorite flowers. My grandmother loved them and got me hooked. Damaged caused by voles. 
They have decimated our potato patch this year. You can see where they chew the potatoes and eat them. It wasn't going to grow anymore. You can see where the voles ate the roots. That's why it stopped growing. This onion would have been like that. These are a few of our pawpaw trees. Pawpaws are native to Kentucky. My grandfather and grandmother loved them. They were their favorite fruit. They're sometimes called an Appalachian banana. Did you plant them? These actually came up from plantings that my grandfather did. They will come up in groups and come up from the roots of other pawpaws. These are antique and heirloom. These are pawpaws. They typically grow in clusters. Pawpaws will typically get four inches, five inches long. This is an old hot tub, and when it died, we turned it into a raised bed for our eggplant. We deal with the voles in our raised beds by keeping them elevated and protected. We're using cloth pots, grow pots, that we found online. This one is a six foot, 400 gallon. It is on a base of pallet wood, which was free, and salvaged wood, which was also free that we found. First, we lay down plastic. You can't see it, it's underneath the wood and hidden by the wood chips in the front. Then we put wood pallets with salvaged wood on top and secure that with chicken wire and hard cloth. It keeps the voles out and it also provides a space that the voles do not want to come up in where they're vulnerable because the cats and the snakes can get to them underneath where we've left it open. And it also provides air circulation, which helps cut down on the increased fungal and bacterial diseases we now have in Kentucky. This is Bowling's Red Okra. We got the seed from Baker Creek. And according to Baker Creek, the Bowling family in Virginia has grown this okra for about 100 years. It will grow to over 8 feet tall when it's mature. And it's already producing beautiful okra. And stunning red. We always use scissors to snip so we don't damage the plant. Can you eat them raw? Yeah, I had them in salads. Oh. Remember the okra I put in the salad the other day? I thought it was green. It was, but this one too. I've got to try one of these raw. Oh, that is so good. Mm-hmm. We put them in salads. Mmm. I don't think I'm going to cook them anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Now, Angie joins uh, my very large group of BFFs, right? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you it's so been much. Very educational. And so much fun. Yeah. We have had such a good time having you here. Are you surprised I came? Flabbergasted. <laughs> Flabbergasted. When I got the email you were coming, I had to sit down. I had to completely sit down. And then I started screaming. <laughs> and then I started getting really scared that my garden wasn't going to be good enough. <laughs> well, it's a whole lot bigger than mine and more diverse. Well, we've, we've taken many years to get there. It's been little steps, but we just kept our goal in mind and we kept pursuing it. And you've been a great inspiration to us to keep going. And, and we'll keep going and expanding even after you're gone. And we will send you updates. All right. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't light up. Safe travels to Late Bloomer. Thank you. Oh, that's good. That's neat. Did you throw these pickles? The cucumbers and the onions. Great. Serve me up. Love that. <laughs>